So we, we start this new uh, series uh, today. Uh, we're going to do it for the next two or three, uh, four, four weeks. Um, called I Heart the 386. Um, you know what the 386 is, right? Okay, it's your area code. It spells fun, by the way. I learned that, which I think is kind of funny. But uh, that's our area code, the 386. And the reason we talk about I Heart the 386 is because, um, well, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, a team of us was meeting. Remember, we were talking about kind of the direction, the vision the church was going in. And, and we started talking about our community, and we would say Ormond Beach. And folks would go, no, 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 no. So Daytona Beach, too. Don't forget about Daytona. All right, right. Ormond Beach and Daytona Beach. No, 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 don't forget about Port Orange. I'm like, right, right. Daytona Beach, Ormond Beach, Port Orange. And they say, well, no, don't forget about Flagler. I'm like, okay, great. Daytona Beach, Ormond Beach, Port Orange, Flagler. And somebody said, well, what about the land? I'm like, fine, just the 386. Call it even, all right? We're gonna, that, that's, that's where we're going to start, just kind of in, in the 386. And I know somebody's going to go, but what about the 407? Just, we're going to start three, 386. Kind of. and so I heart uh, the 386. And so how are we loving our neighbors? Um, and there, there's a command we talked about a few weeks ago in church that we're called to love God and we're called to love our neighbors. And one of the things that we did is we decided we were going to pick three people that we were going to pray for at 3 o'clock to talk about how are we going to share our, our faith with them when we're going on on those people and looking for God provide an opportunity for us. And what I'm realizing is how hard it is for us to do that. Um, and to, to, to love our, our neighbors. So we want to do this series um, because it comes out of our, our dreams. One of our dreams, uh, kind of our core values, is that we will create in our sphere of influence uh, that people will know that we're Christian. They'll know there's something different about us. Like, what does that mean? That, that within our sphere of influence, we're going to love people like Jesus loves them. And for me, what that means is when I go to Publix, the, the Hannah Rose, who I see at Publix regularly, thinks that I'm a good person in the checkout line, even though I'm yelling at her for going so slow. Right? Hannah Rose, just kidding. Right? Hang on. You know, that, that the public people go, oh, okay. Or, or if you go up to your neighbor, and, you, and if you go up to your neighbor, we, what we want them to do is when you say, hey, I'd love for you to come to church with me, we'd love for them to go, oh, okay. What we don't want is when you go, hey, I'd love for you to go to church with me, and then go, you go to church? <laughs> if, if they're not sure you should go to church, you're doing something wrong in how we do it. So we want you to have that ability to say, I, 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 I heart the 386. I love uh, my neighbor. And... This series really has changed though over the last few weeks as I've been thinking about it and praying about it. The original plan was for us to do this by going out and doing things in our community. Um, but our Random Acts of Kindness group really has already kind of taken this on, and they're doing a great job with that. We have the Osceola Elementary School that we're doing things with, and then with the hurricane, we've been really good at going out in our community. And what I'm beginning to realize is that it's really hard for us to love our neighbors because we think it's about trying to get them to believe what we believe. And I'm convinced, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the reason the church is losing its impact isn't because we, we, we don't want to go tell people. I believe everybody in this church wants people to experience a relationship with Jesus. I believe there's a want to. It's a how-to issue. We're just not sure how to do it. And we think what we're supposed to do is to beat them over the head with the right belief. And get you got to believe this way. And so I, I'm convinced part of the problem with the church is we become like American politics. Let's beat the snot out of you so you believe like we do and then everything will be fine. All right? And that's not the message of, of the church. We, we, we should be uh, different. We don't need to tell the world how bad they are. That's not our job. We need to show the world how much they're loved. So how do we love our neighbors? And so we're going to be talking about this. This is that famous story that Jesus does. It's his most famous story. It's the one I, I use it a lot. I know that. So, but I want us to look at it again. It's that, it's that story found in the Gospel of Luke. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, so let's just kind of let me put it up there. I'm going to read it today for you because I'm going to stop at different parts. It says, a legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? So what's the question? Isn't it interesting? I mean, that's the question. Notice Jesus doesn't go, you need to believe these four spiritual laws. Here, here are the things you, here, here's what you need to believe. That there's none, there, notice Jesus doesn't say this, you need to repent of your sins, walk down the altar, cry, pray, and everything's going to be good. He doesn't say that. It's, I mean, it's, it's one of these moments you're kind of like, Jesus, you have an opportunity here. Right? Because this is how we think. We think you need to believe these things. Do that. And what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what is written in the law? Other, what does the Bible say? How do you, and I love this line, how do you? Well, that's a curveball, ain't it? Why didn't Jesus just 
say, let me tell you how you need to interpret it. Because isn't that sort of what we do? Let me tell you what you need to understand about what the scripture passage says. Jesus said, well, what is it written in the Bible? How do you understand that? The guy responds, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Okay, I mean, you get it? Love God, love your neighbor, do this and you will live. Do this and you will have e e eternal life. And I love how Jesus gets this going here on this. But the question we're wrestling with is, who is my neighbor? And, and that's not the question this thing starts off with. How do I get eternal life, which is what we want and what we need to see? And this guy, this guy begins to push there. You see the last verse, right? Well, he wants to prove that he was right. Just be honest. How, don't raise your hands in this moment. We're not going to play. We're not gonna go. How many times in your life have you wanted to prove you were right and ruined everything in that moment? Right? Okay. Wanted to prove that he was right, so he said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And, and I wrote down just some thoughts for me to kind of help me remember, remember this. Uh, this guy really wants to, to figure out exactly who his neighbor is. Who do I have to love? I mean, I want to love, I get, I get mean to love everybody, but let's be specific. Who do I have to love them if they listen to rap music? I mean, my, my son, my middle class white sons love rap music. Do I need to love them? I mean, seriously, I cannot figure this out to save my life, right? What about, what about your University of Florida fans? Do I have to love them? Or University of Miami fan, or y'all, Lord of Mercy, Ohio State people, do we have to love you? I mean, is that, is that a requirement? Do I have to love them if they're going to vote for Hillary? Do I have to love them if they're going to vote for Trump? Do I have to love them if they are poor? Or homeless? Or if they smell? You know, you've been around. What about that waitress, the one with all the tattoos and all the piercings that I can see, let alone the ones I can see? I have to love, I have to love, whatever. And then, and then like, like, what, what about the, you see those people with the gauges? And then they take out the gauges and then just get the big floppy holes in their ears, just kind of bounce around. I have to love them? I mean, because that's just stupid. <laughs> I have to love them, all them. What, what if they don't speak English? And do I have to love them? I mean, if they're not from here, do I have to love them? But what if they aren't educated? I mean, you know, I went to Duke, so I want some highbrow stuff, right? If they're uneducated? What if they have bad teeth? I just, I just don't like people who have bad teeth. you got bad teeth. I mean, go, go to the dentist, Dr. Brown, will hook you up. All right? Do I have to love them? What if they got bad hygiene? Do I have to love them? What about their skin color? Does that matter? But what about who they're married to? Or who they're not married to but living with? Or what about that person I saw out that was married but they were with somebody else? I mean, do I love them? I mean, how, what do you do then? What about, I mean, isn't it interesting? Jesus doesn't define the question. He doesn't say, okay, here's who you got to love. He doesn't tell us who our neighbor is. It's almost like Jesus begins to say, look, everybody's your, let's just assume everybody's your neighbor. Let me tell you how to love them. And so he tells this part of the story. Jesus replies back to this guy. The guy goes, well, who is my neighbor? A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest was going down the same road. When he saw the injured man, he crossed to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came to that spot and saw the injured man. He crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Let me ask you, did the priest and Levite do anything wrong according to the Bible? No. Actually, the priest is following the Bible correctly. Because if the priest is on his way into the temple to do the business that he's called to do, what God has asked him to do, there are rules and commands that you cannot have blood on your hands. There are rules and commands that you cannot do anything with a dead body. You don't know if this guy's alive or dead. The priest is following the Bible just the way he's supposed to, right? We kind of look at the scripture and go, oh, that priest should have gone over. Really? Right? Did the Levite, did he do anything wrong? The only thing he didn't do wrong is he didn't have a cell phone with him to call 911. Right? How many of us have done that? Oh, I can't stop because if I stop to help, what if there's somebody hiding in the bushes? They're going to jump out and get me, right? That's a possibility. Um, or, or, you know, what if I stop to help and, and I 
could get sued. You know, I don't want any of that. Right? I'm, I'm gonna call 911. Right? But likewise, Levi, he came out the other side of the road and went his way. Then a Samaritan who was on his journey came to where the man was. But then when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him, bandaged his wounds, taking them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he gave him two full days worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him, and when I return, I will pay you back any additional costs. Well, what do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered the thieves? Then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy towards him. And Jesus said, then go and do likewise. Love this. This guy on Jericho, we, we don't, it's hard for us to grasp this part of the story. We read this story and we don't understand the hatred of Samaritans. They are a mixed race. They are, they are people who have been supplanted into this area of northern Israel. The Jews hated them. And in turn, they, because they did what we all do. When somebody hates us, what do we do? We have a tendency to hate back, right? So there's animosity. Hate. This part of the story is a critical part when it comes to loving our neighbor. And we miss it because we have such a tendency to want to niceify church. We want to make, we, I mean, when you, when you did the little flannel graph growing up, and you don't have flannel graphs in, in vacation Bible school growing up, the little flannel graph was a good Samaritan looked just like me. He, he looked no different than the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan. It, it looked like just like everybody in this room. That's not what happened. When Jesus says the phrase, but a Samaritan walked by the whole room, and we said, now you will see what happened, right? It would be the equivalent of this. It would be like me telling a story saying there was a United Methodist pastor on his way to Orlando. And he fell among the thieves and beat him up. And as he is laying there, passing by comes uh, uh, another United Methodist pastor on the way to the same meeting and realizes, oh, well, it's got to be okay. And I don't want the DS to be mad at me. I need to get to this meeting, and if I stop to help, it moves on. Shortly thereafter, a Gator fan comes by <laughs> on his way to the University of Florida and realizes because he went to Florida, he's a good attorney. And as he's a good attorney, he realizes if I stop to help Scott, I'm going to be late for the game. And more than that, I'm going to get sued by Scott because he'll find a reason to make this an issue between Florida and Florida State. So I'll just pass by on the other side. And so we're all in a good mood at that moment. And then the storyteller would say, but then this Muslim man came by. You see the, or maybe we read this guy came by, those guys crossing over the border illegally. An illegal alien came over to help. Or maybe the guy in the gay pride came by to help. Or maybe this guy. Or perhaps this person. begins to change the story a little bit, doesn't it? When all of a sudden the hero in the story looks nothing like us, sounds nothing like us, it puts the story in a different light for me. It is hard for me to love my neighbor when I see them as less than us. It's hard for me to love our neighbor when I see them as less than us. And we can't love our neighbor when our prejudices get in the way. And a prejudice means we prejudge somebody. We, we, we make a determination of them and how they're going to act based upon what they look like or what, how they're going to do. Actually, not based upon fact or anything, just things we've heard about groups like them. And so we have prejudged them. And if we're honest in this room, every, I want you, every one of us has some type of prejudice we struggle with. I've just kind of been open about some of mine as I've gone through this. I love how comedian Dennis Leary, maybe the first time you've ever had Dennis Leary mentioned in church, but comedian Dennis Leary, he has this great line. He says, uh, racism isn't born, it is taught. Two-year-olds don't hate because of the color of their skin. It, it's taught. And I know some of us go, well, no, I've, never, I've, never, I've never taught my kids uh, to be racist. I never said but but our terminologies we use and how we talk about groups of people 
In my own family, how I learned that in certain neighborhoods you locked your doors, but in other neighborhoods you don't. And I learned quickly what the differences between those two neighborhoods were. How we act. How we shy away from people. How we talk about even different cities in the 386. Those are all forms of things that we have prejudged people. What I want you to hear is that, and this, I like this term, right? racism is not a skin issue. It is a sin issue. Any type of prejudice is. It is a sin issue. James says it this way. But when you show favoritism, in other words, when I, and I have I, something I struggle with, there, I, when you show favoritism, you say, oh, I like this person. And, I'm, and, and the opposite, when you show favoritism, you are committing a sin. And by that same law, you are exposed as a lawbreaker. When I favor you because when I do this, when I let you play with my kids and do stuff with my kids because you look like me and you act like me and you sound like me, but I won't let you do stuff with my kids or be around my kids because you look different, act different, and sound different than me, that, that's a sin issue. And we all kind of struggle with that. And when we say things like, your, your, your skin's darker than mine, or where you live, or what you believe, or how you were raised. You, raised you, you live on the town I grew up in. You live on that side of the tracks. I can't go. I can't go there. Right? Who you sleep with, it's a sin issue. Because we can't love our neighbors if we don't address our prejudices. I mean, how do we love our neighbors when they look different, and act different, and believe different than us? So when I was thinking about how do we do that, and the first thing is this, name our prejudices. We all have them. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm prejudiced. We, everybody has them. We've been taught them. It's ingrained in us. Begin to name them. There are things I have worked on in my life. I, I'll be honest with you. I am petrified about Thanksgiving. Y'all need to start praying right now for Thanksgiving. Because I will be going to my family reunion. I'll be going to my family reunion, my wife and I, and we're going to have to make a real clear conscious decision. Shut up or leave. Because no matter who's elected for president, it's going to blow up the family reunion. Right? I, I grew up with I, I grew up with some racial and background stuff that I've got to deal with, and how we talk about it. So I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I may be sick. Uh, thanks, guys. Maybe my all of a sudden I get the flu. Y'all remind me it's not the flu. It's just I'm chickening out and going. We all have some prejudice. Do you know when you name something, you have power over it? That's one of the first things they tell you when you have an addiction is name the addiction. You know that uh, when you, I, I say this, I name my children. Uh -huh. I, we talked about this in Jello this week with, with, the, with the little kids. We talked about how Adam named the animals. You know that God's given us power. You know, that's, that's it. Name them. N name, name the prejudices you have. Rich people are snobs. Heavy folks are lazy. Old people can't drive. Young people can't work. White men can't jump. Blacks, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Republicans, Democrats, we all have something that goes over that. I'll admit, I have prejudice in me. One of the prejudices that came up within me early on in my ministry career, I was in Fort Pierce. We needed a new, we needed a new church bus. Uh, and I had said publicly in the church meeting, I was a youth director, I said, listen, the next time this bus breaks down, I'm going to burn it on the side of the road, the entire drive. A couple days later, this guy comes in the office and he looked like a dirt poor farmer. I mean, he was old and had stuff all over him. And, guy, and he goes, are you the young youth director who needs a new bus? I'm like, yes, sir, we're working on it. He goes, well, let me take you to lunch. Let's see what we can figure out. I'm like, oh, I do not have time for this. Seriously, you know, I was a youth director. Really, what was I doing? And he puts me in a truck that felt like it was held together with duct tape. Uh, and we started driving. I'm like, well, where are we going to lunch? Because oh, my wife's cooking lunch for us at the house. We'll go have lunch. I'm like, oh, Lord, here we go. <laughs> and we drive for days in St. Lucie County. I mean, we're, and finally, I just, I'm, I'm worn out. And I'm like, and I Mr. Johnson, are we ever going to get to your house? We don't, I mean, what's the, he goes, we're on my property. I'm like, we're on your property. I'm like, he goes, yeah, we haven't been for the last five or six miles. You heard of uh, Indian River Citrus, right? Yeah, he handed me a $75,000 check for the church bus. And I had judged him as a dirt poor boy that was wasting my time. We all have moments like that. It's a sin issue. To, so name, name those prejudices that, that come up within you. My wife's been on me to call the new rabbi in town. 
There's a new rabbi in town. She's at, 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 at one of them. Tell me about that one. Right, tell me about that one, right? So I, I saw like, fine. So I've called her. I said it publicly now. I'm like, all right, great, great. You know, I mean, I, you didn't know. I grew, up, I grew up in a household. You don't date a Jew, you don't date a Catholic. Period. Uh, my first girlfriend was Catholic. My second was Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me not to do something. You know, so uh, we're going to see if we can get together to talk about that. Name your prejudices. That's how you... Then, then seek to understand others. That's how we love our neighbor. One, acknowledge we have some prejudice. Two, begin to say, look, I, I want to begin to understand you. All right? I, I, I struggle with the Black Lives Matter. I cannot fathom it. I have never been pulled over by a police officer and, my, and, went, and, and worried about anything other than, why are you pulling me over? All I was doing was speeding, and I clearly have a good reason for that. Arrest a criminal, not me, right? I, I can't fathom what it's like to grow up in a world that way. I, I need to seek to understand that. I grew up in a, in a household of law enforcement. My dad was a state attorney. I understand that world, and I... And, and I, I Get that. I can't understand this. Maybe I need to seek to understand from that side. I don't know what it's like. I was telling Terry this morning, no one's ever judged me differently because of who I am. One time in my life. The only time I've ever been judged differently is I went to a debate when I was, I was on the debate team. And I went to a debate. And before that, we were standing around talking with everybody, a bunch of guys and girls talking. And it was Jackson. I'll never forget. It was Jacksonville Bowls, which I still don't like. And Gainesville East Side. <laughs> They got all their hoity-toity stuff and view holes and all those. And I and I'm there, me. I haven't changed much. And but but I was and what my voice is now less southern than it used to be. I mean when I get when I go home it sort of it sort of gets gets a countryfied. And they I heard a couple of them making fun of me that I'm old country boy. They I played that up. I was as Andy Griffith as you could be. <laughs> And then I beat the snot out of them in the debate and made sure that all the Yankee boys understood exactly how dumb cracker I was. Right? And I can say the only time I like I felt like I've been, because seriously, I'm white male middle class in America. I don't understand. I'm privileged in oak all kinds of ways. So I'm gonna seek to understand. And I think the Good Samaritan, he goes over to the guy that's beat up. He's the hero in the story. And so part of it is, it's my responsibility to go over to somebody who's different than me, looks different, sounds different, acts different than me, to get to know them. And then commit to love those who are different than us. Commit to love those who are different than us. You, you know how a good Samaritan does it. He goes over, he spends his time, his energy, his money, his resources. We, we commit to... To love them. Because Paul tells us in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And then I love this passage uh, from Revelation. We'll put that one up. This is, uh, this is when we all get to heaven. After this, I looked and there was a great crowd that no one can number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Just stop right there. Every nation, tribe, people, and language. Who don't you want to be living next to in heaven? Is, is there a group you're like, yeah, I don't want to be on that subdivision. Right? That might be something to think on and wrestle with. Because when we get to heaven, they're going to, let's just be honest, they're going to be people who get to heaven, they're going to look at me going, I had no idea you were going to make it in here, boy. <laughs> And I'm going to look at some people and go, really? I don't want to wait to heaven to be that way. I'd rather here and now begin to feast in the kingdom, the table of God. Saying there is neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew. We are all one in Christ Jesus. That every nation, tribe, people, and language God loves. I don't understand. And I know that some of my actions teach my children things that I don't want them to do. So I'm going to work on it. I'm going to name my prejudice. I'm going to seek to understand those who are different. 
and that I'm going to commit to love. I believe that's the best step for me to start doing. So I can heart the 386, and so I can love my neighbor. And in loving my neighbor, I believe I show them Christ. And then the lives are going to be changed. I said lives are going to be changed because I don't just think it'll be their life that'll be changed. I think mine will as well. <laughs> On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks unto God. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup. And he gave thanks unto God. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you should drink of it in remembrance of me. So today we come in remembrance of all that God has done for us. We come in remembrance of, of God's love and God's grace that's been poured out in our lives. We come in remembrance that all of us in this room have something that we are prejudiced, racist, something within us that causes us to see groups of people as less than. And that is a sin. So we come forward today and we're going to remember that I love, can you put that picture up, uh, Susan? Susan found this great picture. I love that imagery. That's our neighbor. Are we willing to go over to them and help them? Let's pray. God, just pour out your spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of the bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we feast on them, we might experience your love and your grace. Help us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Because we don't want anybody to treat us different because of how we look. Or how we talk. Or what we say. Or who we're with. We want people to love us for us. May we do the same. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.